share with you what I personally think of as the Thousand Hills campaign because when we started to get close and God started to show his heart for these kids and how he wanted to rescue them and do something that nobody was doing uh, but needed to be done, we said, how in the world are we going to raise all the money for this? It's so impossible. And he said, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. And so I think of this as the Thousand Hills uh, campaign, but due to it being an explicitly biblical reference and God is certainly expanding, um, you know, his ownership of the cattle on a thousand hills, even beyond those that are currently Christians, we're going to be calling this the Give Hope for Tomorrow Today campaign. Uh, what am I talking about? That's what I'm going to explain to you now. This is going to start on August 26th. It's going to go for four weeks. It's going to end on September 23rd because we are at a place where God has opened a door to actually change a city. And I'm not overstating that. He has really opened a door to step into what he's shown in his heart and it will change a city. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians 16, verse 8. He says, I'm going to remain in Ephesus for a wide door for effective service. It has opened to me. And we have this opportunity to walk through this door, but there is some urgency to do it. So God has provided this opportunity, uh, most of you are aware of this, to purchase a 2.4 acre plot of land in Puerto Escondido, which would have the capacity, once it's fully built out, to rescue up to 200 at-risk and vulnerable children. In a community where to date approximately half are being abused and exploited, their vulnerability is leading to extreme exploitation. But God's writing a new history. So if you've been here recently, you've heard of this, you've heard this call um, for us to care for those that God has laid at our gate. What you may not know is how rare of an opportunity this is to find a piece of property in Puerto capable of facilitating this vision. But I also want to tell you a little bit of the story that I haven't told you guys before. How did we actually end up getting to this place of pursuing this specific property in Puerto, it's probably good to tell you heading into Puerto and all the other locations, our team had some ideas, uh, not only for Puerto, but for all the other four locations in Latin America beyond Mexico City, which was the first. And all of our ideas could be summarized with this. Woo, <laughs> that was a big deal. That was hard. Now let's just, you know, start small as we go into these other places. I'm picturing like maybe house churches is, is, is kind of the way to go at this point. Uh, but God had something else in his heart, and he made it pretty clear pretty fast in prayer specifically. The first prayer time that we had... One of us that was present praying at that time saw a Goliath and there was another giant behind the first giant, but the second giant was actually twice as tall as the first. And I was like, I don't know if I have the gift of interpretation, but I'm not sure I like where this is going. But the first one fell and when he fell, it hit the knees of the one that was twice as tall behind him and that giant fell as well. So Right away, any notion the second thing was going to be smaller and easier, it got dispelled by the Holy Spirit quickly, uh, while also acknowledging that the faith that led to the first one falling is what is going to give the momentum of faith to see also the second giant fall. So as you know, the first assignment God gave us when we got to Puerto Escondido was to meet with five pastors, learn about the needs of the city, what was already being done, and what the gaps uh, were. And so we did that, and in that first conversation... With the very first pastor, the Spirit of God fell as his eyes became filled with tears in response to being asked about the need. He just pleaded, it's the youth. The youth need help. And as we went back the second time, we were praying and God just showed it and impressed a number of things uh, on our elder team. Praying about where one elder saw this extremely strong picture of a red delicious apple. Um, like t the technical delicious apple. Uh, not that they tasted it in the vision. Uh, another saw a shovel and they saw dirt. Uh, one felt strongly impressed upon that we need to pay attention to this area around the airport. Um, now, if you know what God did in Mexico City in only our first week down there, you can imagine that when someone saw an apple reminiscent of the orange of Mexico City, we kind of went ham looking for an apple street. 
where's the Monsana Street or the Monsana Tree Street or everywhere we went, do you have any apple trees on this property? You know, we were looking for the apple and over and over and over the answer was, was no. And so we weren't really sure what to do with it. Uh, but while we were talking to one of the local pastors there, uh, Huberto, and we were having lunch with him, and we just felt prompted to share, um, you know, something prophetically we had heard. We, we just realized he was comfortable and familiar with the prophetic. Uh, but when we shared about uh, the apple, the mansana, well, he smiled and he says, oh, well, of course he did. I was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. We weren't tracking with why he said that, so we asked. And that's when he explained that an apple is what we call a full city block here. It's like the whole piece of land, like the whole mansana. It's a mansana. It's that whole thing. It's not like half of it or a portion of it. It's the whole mansana. And we're like, you've got to be kidding me. And the peace of God was falling as he was explaining this to us. We really felt like, okay, we know what he meant. Um, It wasn't just like, corrective it was directive so we were thinking small but God had heard the pleas and the prayers of these moms and of these kids and he isn't just planning to help like one or two of them and so we started to say we need to look at every mansana in this city and get it all laid out and understand what's for sale and all that sort of stuff and one of them I was like this would be really ideal it was a full mansana Uh, it was a school that had been built but had been abandoned since COVID, but they wanted 15 million U.S. dollars for it. And I was like, that's more than double the Goliath there. Um, And so that's what led to our learning that in this place, uh, buying something that's already been developed is a lot more expensive than actually building it due to a number of reasons, local materials, support from the community, a lot of people being familiar with the construction uh, process things like that. So this combination of learning that with the mansana and this picture of the shovel in the dirt, we got to work researching full mansanas of land. And the one that you've seen all the pictures of, it wasn't only the best price of all the full mansanas, it was the one that was also best positioned to be able to care for the kids in the actual community as it's right in the residential area of the city. Uh, not where all the new tourist stuff is developing, and there's a lot of families in great need there right by the airport. So we started this process with the owner. We quickly learned that he had already done all this work to parcel up the land and was about to start selling individual lots from it. And he would definitely make a lot more money by doing that, but as he heard about this project, he began to ask more questions, and the more questions he asked, he started to get really interested in it, and he agreed to sell the whole if we could close in a reasonable time frame. He didn't want to be held up forever by something that, you know, could fall through or whatever, and so that was 90 days from that point, from the beginning of October. whenever it was, 90 days ends at the beginning of October. So the total price tag for that 2.4 acres is 1.7 million. To date, just over 600,000 has come in. It leaves a balance of 1.1 left to raise in, you know, about six weeks or so. Now, I know that that sounds like you've lost your minds ludicrous and certainly impossible. It absolutely is impossible in the natural Uh, But there's a time you know something is in the heart of God, and it's like, oh, I always wanted to walk by faith, and now I get to do it. And so that's what we're doing. And I am full of faith. He's going to do this. He's going to make a way. As we've prayed all along about how, he's always emphasized. Again, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's going to bring in provision from places we've never seen the provision come in before and outside of the walls of the church. As part of that, we are, we've been planning galas across the country. There's the one that's happening here in Denver, but there's a number of other cities that are all moving forward as well. The one here, as a reminder, it's August 22nd, uh, and we have final numbers um, for that to be turned in at the end of this week. So if you haven't uh, purchased your ticket, you're waiting on friends to RSVP or whatever, I want to encourage you to follow up uh, with them and do so early this week. But this is not the only fundraising strategy. Another strategy that God has led us in is this 1,000 by 1,000 strategy. 
meaning a thousand different people, each working to raise $1,000 a piece, the thousand by a thousand. Over 30 days, this is a million dollars in a month prayer goal. So this is one of the opportunities that all of us have to bring our loaves and bring our fishes, whatever they are. And I'm really full of faith. God's going to do it. I believe he's going to make a way. He's the one who's given us the strategy, uh, but we've got to be faithful to do our part. Uh, something that God's put on my heart recently is that a lot of people read stories in the Bible. And they say, man, I wish God would have invited me to be a part of a miracle like that, whatever it is. Like I've never seen masses fed. I've never seen, you know, battle-proof walls fall. I I've never seen seas split. But something he's been putting in my heart lately is how many masses have never been fed, how many Jericho walls have remained unfallen, and how many seas have never been split because we didn't give what we have. Because we didn't walk when he said to walk. Because we didn't step at his command. If there has ever been a fishes and loaves miracle, this is it. I believe to the depths of me he's inviting all of us to be a part of seeing him do the impossible. But we each have a part to play. Imagine, for example, being equipped with all of the tools and all of the resources to run a month-long social media campaign using your Facebook, your Instagram, your whatever you have, asking your friends to take five minutes to give $5 to be a part of this campaign to change an entire city's tomorrow. That is the plan. Of course, personal reaching out to contacts, you know, it works even better and you'll certainly be equipped with the resources to do that as well. So this is what I'm inviting you uh, now to prepare for, which would you know, you'll be equipped next weekend post-service at either Saturday or Sunday service. Plan for that if you're going to do this. So what does helping look like? First is pray. It has to be God that moves hearts to do this. It can only be done by his hand. Two, commit to be one of the uh, thousand who sets out with this prayer goal to raise a thousand in 30 days. Um, three, I'm asking you to become a team captain by building a team of people this week, which means that you would kind of share this vision with a few family members and friends. Uh, you'd share why it matters to you, ask them to join you and be one of those thousand people participating in this thousand by uh, a thousand. And, and why build these teams? Well, there's a number of reasons. One, to get to a thousand participants who are not all Revolution Church attenders, we need you guys to build teams with networks that you have, friends that you have. As a reminder, both Hope Homes and the English Advantage are very accessible uh, to people outside the church or the Christian faith, um, as it is to those that are part of the Christian faith. Two, uh, you know, Rebecca and I and the small team who are helping, uh, we simply cannot connect with and do all the follow ups with a thousand individual. Uh, people, and we just know our, our limit um, in that. You got to understand that whenever we add new things and God calls us to new things, like all of our staff are like fully kind of maxed with whatever they do, it pretty much falls to us to do all the new stuff. And so we're doing a lot of new stuff with um, all of these events and fundraising and uh, planting campuses and stuff of that nature. Um, so we need a team. Uh, we just can't do it alone. We need an army, actually. Uh, of people who have it in their hearts to see what God has in his heart to happen uh, in order to see this miracle happen. Three, people aren't going to respond to us, um, you know, like they will to somebody who knows them and has a relationship who's kind of following up and continuing to cheerlead uh, their teams over the course of those 30 days. So that's why we need teams. Uh, but as you recruit people to your team, of course, in addition to hearing about the problem and the solution uh, from you and, and seeing the video, which is available, it's uploaded on the Hope Homes website. That's just hopehomesinternational.com. Um, they'll also need to know, well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to raise $1,000 in 30 days? By and large, as I mentioned, this will be a social media campaign. Although people are free to raise it, they could do dinners, they could do coffees, they could sell candy bars or whatever, you know, God puts into their heart. It's by and large a social media campaign where when this thing launches, everyone who's participating will receive simple steps 
and support to run that social media campaign over the course of a month. Daily reminders and materials to post fresh stuff, uh, progress toward the goal that they can, you know, post and keep everyone informed. Uh, graphics, the video, compelling language. Um, that's part of the equipping toolkit that everyone's going to receive. Uh, with, of course, also the link to be able to actually help meet the need and the ability to see how their progress is going and the team's progress uh, is going. So on your way out, you're going to receive a handout. Um, the front page will look like what you're seeing uh, behind me. What I'm asking you to do this week is to form a team, up to 10 people who will say, yes, I'm going to set out to raise $1,000 over these 30 days along with you. Maybe it's going to be you. Maybe it's going to be you and your spouse. Maybe some extended family, friends, colleagues, whatever that might be. But this is the week where you would say to them, um, and this is in the packet that you're going to receive on the way out, some language that might help. I'm not going to read that for the sake of time, but that's going to be in the packet. And also, if you want to receive a soft copy of some example language of how you might invite people to be on your team, uh, just email Rebecca Layton, and she will get you that soft copy. That's our Rebecca at flrchurch.com. Sorry, I blanked on your email. How practically would we recommend you to identify and build your team? Of, the, uh, of other people doing the fundraising, step one is to pray. And I'm, I'm serious, like pray and ask God, God, would you like put on my heart and my mind the people that you want to participate and you want me to invite to, you know, uh, do this with me, write down everyone he brings to mind. Step two is your contacts. Go through your contacts. Go through the contacts on your phone, your social media friends. Make a list of those that you're going to ask uh, to give. These are those that I'm, you know, going to contact to be on my team. Third is to invite. So, you know, send them the invite that, uh, uh, for those that you're going to ask to join your team. And you need to do this by Tuesday at the latest in order to stay on track. Um, so Tuesday at the latest, by Friday, you really want your team formed. Step four is to follow up with your potential team members to make sure you answer questions, land your team. Step five, fill out the team sheet. And step six is to attend next week's meeting. It's post-service Saturday, post-service uh, Sunday. I think we can do a recording of it for those that already have travel plans. But that's the idea. You're welcome to get up, by the way, and go at any moment you need to. I know that you're staying later than normal. Um, but I wanted to end saying one thing, and then I'm going to just leave room for Q&A for anyone that has that. When we first went to this piece of land and visited it, I had the same exact feeling that I had when we first walked into this building after seeing so many other buildings. Like, I felt that. It was the same feeling I had when I walked in the building in Colorado Springs. And it was the same feeling I had when I walked in the building in Mexico City. And I was a little confused because it wasn't a building. It was just dirt. But I've learned, like, to start paying attention to that unique feeling I have gotten, like, the peace of God resting on it. I just want you to know, I believe that God's handpicked this place and he's protected one of the last Monsanas left that's actually in the interior of the city uh, where it would need to be to be able to be effective for the mission. I believe in this and I'm going to run after it with everything I have. And I just wanted to speak to you personally um, from that. There's a Actually, it was the very first visit. I was taking videos of myself and taking photos. It's like something came over me where I just was really into this land. In fact, I heard it was a peanut field, and I was like, oh, I bet I could preach something about these little peanuts, you know, growing up out of the ground, and we're going to raise up a generation of peanuts or whatever. I was down there taking photos with my iPhone, making them look good and fancy, and they were like, that's just, that's just a weed. That's not a, that's not a peanut. I was like, well, whatever. I tried.